We are back with Rusty and Rusty Vignettes and my favorite guest, James LaFon. Uh, and today we are going to get into the history of policing slash law enforcement. Uh, and this subject for me, um, I think is one of, there's a lot of uh, gems that James has in to, you know, in any number of the podcasts he's been in, in any number of the articles and books that he's wrote. But for me, this is the biggest gem of all is his red pilling on what the history of police, what it means, what they do, what they've done and where they're going in the future. I think this is the most relevant uh, eye opening information in today's world in America that um, James LaFon has. He has all types of other interesting, relevant information. But for me, this is the most, I guess, like I said, eye-opening and fascinating and current um, because a lot of people, I mean, I don't talk about current events that much. I try not to for various reasons. And I also am just not that much into politics or political theory or ideology um, because it, there's a ton of one thing. There's a ton of content on there, out there, and on YouTube or in podcasts and everything else. But the one thing that's interesting about the ideological divide in America is their stance on the right and left. Generally speaking, their view of law enforcement. Traditionally, you know, uh, the right wing has viewed law and order as their thing. And the left wing is being kind of known for being, you know, naturally more rebellious, more prone to pro to protest, to riot, to loot, um, to aggravate and agitate for rights. Um, and all that said, in 2020 and now in 2021, we're seeing a lot of developments that are kind of confusing, I think, to a lot of people and disorienting. But if you learn about the history of policing and law enforcement, I think it helps it helps kind of really uh, grasp what's going on behind the scenes and what the machinations are and why this is happening. And so having said all that in that long winded introduction, I'd like James to um, take us through a little bit about the history of policing. And I know it goes way back, um, but a lot of people don't know that. Um, you can see ancestors to police in the ancient Athens with the Scythian, I mean, with the Scythian archers that they employed in the city and with, to a certain extent, with the Sudanese that the Egyptians used. And the thing that it struck me the most uh, when you talked about this before in other platforms and other podcasts, you said that the Scythian archers in Athens Okay, archers are really, you said, number one, archers are good policemen in the ancient world to have. And also that in Athens, the hoplites would be up on the wall looking out for what's on the other side of the wall. The other, the foreign invader, the barbarian, whatever. And the Scythian, who was not an Athenian, would be looking inside the wall policing <clears throat> Athenians. Basically, and, yeah. and so that that just kind of struck me as like kind of an, an ancient development of police being employing like the people that were the the elites, the oligarchs, whatever you want to call them, the people that ran the show from the very beginning know that a foreign police having a mercenary police force or a foreign police force or people that are not sympathetic to the majority ethnicity or people that they're policing is critical to, you know, having uh, a strict law enforcement. Of course. Yeah. The, the biggest thing that you see, uh, and we can just uh, not look at earlier forms of policing that much and focus on America, the, the biggest thing that you see throughout all of history with violence in general, and it was a subject of that book, 40,000 Years from Homeless, I 
probably can't roll my bar one experiences as an exercise to compare it to history in general is the modern person believes because he's been indoctrinated to that violence is primarily the poor attacking the middle and the rich and that the reason well you know the people on the right will agree that it's the poor people that's committing most of the violence the people on the left will even agree that it's the poor people committing most of the violence but they will excuse it by saying that poverty drives violence that the impoverished person is the person that conducts violence but throughout history you see the majority of violence is conducted by people who have more material assets than those they attack uh, for instance in medieval Europe in Christendom uh, the person that was least violent was a monk who took a vow of poverty and owned no possessions the person that was most violent was the knight who spent most of his time raping pillaging and slaughtering unarmed or poorly armed peasants who had almost as little worldly assets as um, as the monk and also the peasant underneath the peasant was as best he was at least free if he was if being picked upon underneath him is the serf the slave of the land the person that's actually the church has reassigned his bondage to the land to relieve the slave owner of the moral burden of owning a slave and now the slave owner that owns the land by virtue of owning the land he gets to use the serfs who are owned by the land so it's just a semantic workaround for slavery all the way up to uh, my experience uh, in Baltimore when I'm attacked by uh, when I was attacked by uh, feral Utes men of you know a more saintly hue than myself they all had smartphones I never owned a smartphone they all had were wearing ten times the value of clothing that I was wearing and you multiply this by their numbers and they've all got a thousand dollar phone I've got a uh, hundred and fifty dollar flip phone uh, the police are making fifty to hundred and fifty thousand a year they have an automobile they have firearms they have vests they have all this equipment that I can't even afford as a guy making ten fifty an hour working at night you know uh, in 2011 2010 to 2017 everybody that preys upon me has more worldly assets than I do and this is the same thing for the young african-american fellow in the city who is 16 years old going to walk his dishwashing job and he gets beat up by three or four grown men who own an automobile and who have firearms okay uh, this is it is common for the aggressor to be materially more well off than whoever is being aggressed upon and this is in the same in most military situations usually the aggressor is the one uh, that has the better weapon kit he's got better transportation you know he's got the Mongols got eight horses almost nobody in the medieval societies they, that they attacked owned any horses at all you'd have to be a rich man to even own one and each Mongols got eight horses like having an athlete with owning eight uh, high-performance cars uh, I was attacked many many times by motorists I was a pedestrian one thing you find out uh, as a pedestrian a working class pedestrian is that police in automobiles routinely harass and attack you follow you try to rob you uh, threaten to take your freedom away and rednecks and pickup trucks routinely uh, threaten to attack you until you hit 50 years old then they start slowing their truck down and they tell you, you can cross the road but when you're still young and good-looking they're trying to attack you because uh, you're on foot and you're a low status man see uh, and then uh, the other people that have attacked me from automobiles have been African Americans in automobiles which happened I, I even had three uh, uh, European American construction workers threatened to beat me up on a purely recreational basis while they were leaving the Dunkin Donuts with their coffee in 2017 at 445 in the morning while I waited for the bus in the rain I was in so much pain I could hardly stand up uh, I think I was using my umbrella as a crutch and these guys seriously tried to pick a fight with me were calling me names 
kept slowing down to see if I had the terminity to even look their way. Even looking their way was going to get me stomped into oblivion. Was this and in Baltimore? I'm sorry. This was, this was in Baltimore County on Stemmers Run Road and Eastern Boulevard across the, the street from Kenwood High School uh, or Kenwood Elementary School with my back to the Dunkin' Donuts right in front of a Save-A-Lot grocery store. And I'm standing outside of the bus shelter because this older white woman is using it as her homeless shelter. I didn't want to be in there with her and have her, you know, feel uncomfortable. So, uh, but what happens is when you want to beat somebody up so that you can bond with your fellow pack members, you do not want the government to come down upon you and crush you. You want to celebrate it. You want to have a victory. You want to feel better about your position in society. So you find the person who has lower social status than you. So these rednecks in the pickup truck were not picking fights with any of the uh any of the brothers out there they were looking for a guy of their race who had lower status than they did okay and the uh older homeless african-american guys in baltimore a couple of them get stomped to death or burned alive every year in baltimore by who by teenagers of their own race who have now located a person with a lower social status than them. Almost all the violence that happens inside of a society and most violence that happens between other societies, military violence, is committed by a more well-off party, socially and materially, going after a less well-off party. When has the United States acted as a defender in a war? When has the United States been attacked by another nation in a war okay this has happened uh two times it's it's happened against the british who was better off the british were better off the anomaly was the japanese the japanese got suckered into attacking the united states so the united states could then behave offensively through almost the whole portion of the war so almost every battle between japan japan and america even though japan was actually uh acting defensively because it had been attacked first almost every battle is the the power with the greater material assets attacking the power with the lesser material assets every other american war has been an offensive war by america it might have been for morally good or economically justifiable reasons i'm not making a morality judgment but who's better off vietnam or the united states who has more industrial capacity, the Third Reich or the United States? Who's better off, Iraq or the United States, Afghanistan or the United States, Panama or the United States, Granada or the United States, Chad or the United States? Okay, uh, these are all countries we've attacked with military operations. The person who has the logistical ability to launch an attack and the, and the lower expectation of retribution based on their superior social or material position or their greater size and strength uh whatever is more likely to launch the attack you know the you know the lion is more likely to attack the wildebeest than a wildebeest is likely to attack the lion you know it, it's, it's just who's going to launch the attack the wolf on the coyote or the coyote on the wolf the wolf's going to attack the coyote not the other way around but what about the, yeah ahead. i'm sorry the I mean, that I never like a lot of things talking to James. I I get um I love the talks because I, I think of things different ways that I never thought about that seem kind of simplistic in retrospect, but not too simplistic because I don't I've never thought about it like that before. But I would say that what about the notion that Growing up, you know, bullying, whatever you want to call it, getting roughed up, getting picked on um, in through house, high school and young adulthood or whatever you there is this kind of I don't know if it's real or not, but there's this kind of um, trope or motif that you got this big ass dude, right, that is not going to fight smaller guys like by that. What I mean is there's this notion that. If you go to a bar or a club or a house party, uh, my own common sense or whatever tells me that 
the guys that like I'm a smaller guy, not tiny, but I'm not big. And I never was like if I'm I can't make it that personal because who knows about my own personality. Maybe I'm just good at diffusing situations and not appearing like a threat or being nice or whatever. <laughs> but I never there wasn't no there was never a big ass dude that was threatening me like in situations um it was always a guy that was around my size or smaller that was popping out popping off at the mouth um that I had to worry about I just wanted I know this is a ground level thing and not but a these geo- are challenges this is yeah. not predation yeah this is the guy is uh there's lots of little guys that are confident in beating up big guys. So pick fights with big guys. That's a fight. That's not predation. Okay. okay? Predation. And it doesn't always mean they're bigger. I yep. prayed on larger men okay, <laughs> because I thought they did me wrong. Okay. Mm. Uh, for whatever reason, I spent some time as a teenage psychopath after being beat up by teenagers through all my single digits. You know, I'm nine years yep. old. I'm being beat up by teenagers or essentially physically men. Uh, so I developed a taste for attacking people who were larger than me uh, when I finally became physically mature. But again, we're you know that is a challenge. That's yeah. not predation. That's not predation. Yeah. You know that's that's not what that's about. Okay. And it's about enhancing their social status. So if you're going to prey on somebody, you're going to go with somebody that's got lower well social status. If you want to enhance your social status. Then you want to pick a fight with a guy that's your size or bigger and has a good reputation. Hopefully he's a super handsome captain of the football team or something like that. And then that pumps your station up. You want to be like the United States in the War of 1812 where we pick a fight with the largest nation in the world and we end up with a draw. And then that really that finally brings us into the worldwide arena. That's a fight. That's not predation. We didn't go out there and pray on Great Britain. Okay. We actually picked a fight with them so that we can gain more respect as an international power. Okay. That makes sense. Mexico, we yeah. prayed upon Mexico. Spain, we prayed upon Spain. Okay. Mm-hmm. So th- these are, uh, you know, so that's how nationally you could use that uh, as, yeah. as a model. Yeah. I, and that's, it's like, yeah, when you, I'm trying to think about like, um, a time when, like, when a noticeable empire or place, um, like, like the Roman, like, Roman civilization, they did a lot of predation, but um, but they had hegemonic wars too. For yeah, Carthage, yeah, yes. That was a knockdown, that, drag out, yeah. three round battle between. Could have went either way in the beginning. There were, Right. They were fighting for supremacy. That's basically a national level fight. Okay. Everything else that Rome did until it ran into trouble Mm -hmm. was predation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Except if you go back early in their history, they were preyed upon by Etruscans. They were preyed upon by Gauls. And then after they beat the Carthaginians, they flipped this around and they started preying upon the Gauls. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, and then every other fight they have until they run into the Parthians and they meet their match. Every other fight they have is predation. And then finally, towards the end of their dominance, they start getting into fights first with the Parthians. Then they end up in a fight with uh, uh, with the Persians, uh, which really ruins them. You know, so you have these uh, you have ways we can compare aggression yeah. on a national scale with it, with aggression on the internal scale but know? that's so. and i know that you started with you know talking about like how i mean that's what i meant like it, it's shocking or surprising when you think about it if you haven't thought about it like this but it's true like like when i th- it's like it's having guys that prey on people that are their same ethnicity or Roughly same culture. Well, that has to do with proximity and opportunity. Yeah. Okay. And then there's other dynamics. For instance, that's the reason with the African-Americans, why they constantly pray on each other. That's who they live around. 
Yeah. They're starting to spread the love a little bit more. The specific reason why I was often preyed upon by people of my son of my own ethnicity was because either the people of the other race in the area were too dangerous to prey upon <laughs> or yeah. or it was legally and socially taboo for them to prey upon these people. And when I would be attacked by people of my own race, it was almost always in an area where people of my race had to buy drugs from people of the enemy race. And I know how these guys act when they sell drugs to people of the enemy race. They'll put a gun in your face. They'll call you names. They'll even challenge you to a fight. They might even change the price. But you really want your cocaine, Mr. Redneck. And your buddy in a truck with you is a coward, too. So you're not going to pop off against these five brothers when one of them's got a gun. So on the way out of town, when you see this scrawny little long-haired white boy waiting for the bus... You can blow off some steam and threaten to kick his ass. I guess this is kind of why um, part of the reason, part of it explains why I, I, I've never asked you this before, but it seems like it's kind of obvious that you don't have any type of um, kind of allegiance to something like a race or an ethnicity because it seems kind of foolish. Why would I? <laughs> Why would I demonstrate allegiance to the people that have attacked me my yeah. entire life? To have I don't me know. Out my entire could, life since childhood. Yeah. And then, and then as an adult, as soon as things get to the point where I'm constantly being attacked by people of another race, then the police of my race are constantly harassing me. Okay. Mm -hmm. And making sure that I'm unarmed and defenseless against mm -hmm. the enemy race. And non-police of my own race, every time it seems they get, they get punked out by people of the other race that are typically attacking me, they want to recreationally beat me up. One uh, night I was walking to work, and it was before it was dark. It was a September night. I was walking to the bus stop from my house, 3206 Caucasian Avenue, where I with with Sensei Steve in Unlocked House. Anybody was invited in that they thought they could beat Sensei Steve in a fight. Okay? So uh, I'm walking down the street. I see this big pickup truck rumbling by. I see these two guys that look like they could be members of Molly Hatchet or Leonard Skinner. Big, burly, bearded, long-haired dudes, right? And this giant muscle truck. And I'm walking along with my little handbag with my work gloves in it and my lunch. And I'm heading down to the bus stop. And I look straight ahead after I glance at him, and then one of them says, bitch, you better look the other way, or we're going to stomp your ass. I knew better than to look back at him. If I look back at him, I'm fighting two guys, both of whom are 10 years younger than me and 100 pounds bigger than me. So wh wh where am I to win? Here. And now well, this is in an area where almost all the crime in this area is being committed by African Americans. Okay, and I'm being threatened by African Americans also. Yeah. These guys are recreationally looking to just stomp me out for the fun of it. In that instance, they were black or white. I'm sorry, I was. These guys look like they were like a 1970s Southern rock band. Yeah, yeah, like, that's what I. Yeah, they look sorry. like the guitarist, the yeah. Leonard Skinner band. I mean, these guys are like. I just you want know, people that are listening to <laughs> to pay attention right. to that, you know, because I think. You know, now, the last year I was in Baltimore, I was attacked exactly 20 times. This was in 2017. Two times I was attacked by European Americans. Mm -hmm. One time I was attacked by a salt and pepper crew, mixed race crew. That's mm -hmm. out of 17. Now, time number 16, I'm attacked by a pit bull. Since its owner was an African-American and the pit bull was brown and black, I'm going to count him as African-American. Okay? <laughs> Fair enough. All right? Okay? <laughs> yeah. So that was the ratio of my last year in Baltimore. That's when I decided I had to leave. I could not successfully defend myself against this field of attackers anymore. That because of the Baltimore riots, it, it – uh, Two years after the Baltimore riots, things had gotten to the point where for my two hour journey 
from my resident from the room I rented in Baltimore City to the grocery store I worked at on a night crew in Baltimore County, I was the only person out there on foot that was not a hunter. I was the only game animal out there. I was the only prey out there. There was the bus driver piloting an empty bus asking me to be careful because I'm his last patron. Two years before, 30 guys used to take this bus, okay, and most of them were young African-American guys. They had already been hunted out. Every one of them guys had been hunted into unemployment or the hospital, okay, uh, or they were spending most of their money taking Ubers back and forth to work. I was the last guy over that 10-mile stretch of city and county that was out there at night not looking for somebody to take down. Okay, so it became too dangerous for me. Uh, and some of the people attacking me were of my own race at that point. You know, this would fluctuate as a neighborhood changes. You know, in some areas, the only people of my own race that, that would attack me would be wearing blue. Yeah, I figure. Um, the And, like... Uh, just because it came across my mind right now, I have to ask, like, you know how um, you may be aware of, like, Steven Pinker, this, like, liberal academic who his shtick is that things are progressing, we're being, we're, you know, everything's getting better, we're less violent statistically, blah, 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 regardless of whether or not you know the author or the academic, you, you're aware right. of. He's that some knows. dude that knows how to lie with numbers. And, yeah, exactly. And he's taking yeah. numbers that have already been juked by the police departments. Okay. Can you can you talk about a little bit how the numbers are nuked or fudged? Juked. It's African American police term. J U K E D. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, and juked. Juking the numbers. Uh, in Baltimore City and Baltimore County, the crime of home invasion has not been recognized by the police or the press for thirty years. It does not exist. Forcible entry into a residence while the inhabitants are home is the definition of home invasion. Uh, okay. So if you are an old lady sitting at your kitchen table and a hood rat kicks in the back door or some pale faced crackhead kicks in the front door and they walk up to you and they rip your wallet or your checkbook out of your hand and they walk back out, that is now listed as a burglary. Now, the definition of a burglary is breaking in by stealth as a sneak thief, not threatening anybody, not attempting any physical harm. And usually a burglary is strictly defined as occurring in an empty house when the people when the residents are away and, and a really strict definition of uh, burglary and home invasion would make anything a home invasion if you if you broke a window or kicked in a door to get in okay when somebody was home the exception would be if you picked a lock and you snuck in or if you walked in through a door that was already open okay uh, so you can see where just the wall as it's written it's designed to be something that can be obfuscated and argued about so that's that's it. The one year in one year, uh, murders in Baltimore almost doubled. Yet the Baltimore Sun from the Baltimore City Police Department report that all other violent crime is down twenty seven percent. Yeah. Uh, well, this is because they're juking the numbers. You're recategorizing crimes. So mm -hmm. if it's a you word know. game. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's all it is. So these are the numbers. So I don't care who they are. Some liberal guy, yeah. academic, some uh, quasi right wing uh, libertarian like Stefan Molyneux. Mm -hmm. They all operate off of numbers that are operational lies to begin with. In Baltimore, they recategorize homicides. What, how's that work? <laughs> They just take it off the list. And two years ago, 10 homicides were were taken off. They just they don't announce it. They just redact them. Oh, so the what? Heck, the the person yeah. that was Jesus Christ and they they, they came out of the tomb. OK, <laughs> I mean, what is that? You know, I mean, nobody told me about the second coming. 
you know, but this is this is what they do. So what they do is, for instance, Detective David Souter, who was murdered while on duty investigating a murder the day before he was supposed to testify against the Guns and Drugs Task Force in Baltimore, who were robbing drug dealers. He's murdered while on duty while being assigned to work with a police officer. He does not even know his his partner had been pulled off the job suddenly. Uh, that was originally listed as a homicide, but local law enforcement and then federal law enforcement recategorized it as suicide, which, you know, supposedly Detective David Souter is the first African-American in U.S. history to actually off himself instead of making somebody else do it. You know, so uh, even though he had five kids and he had a nice house and a, and a wife born and everything. So that's another thing, you know, where you take something and you're not going to say that this infant that died on January 4th now committed suicide. Okay. Yeah. Or, or this, that, yeah, you know, so it's just law enforcement is under a lot of pressure to lie about the numbers and to misreport things. A and, lot of political pressure. Yeah. Um, since, since you know that I like, um, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, I like film, uh, generally. I have to ask now because it just came up if what you thought of the show, The Wire, just roughly. Uh, you... A lot of the aspects of it were very accurate. The view of police management was scrupulously accurate. Uh, mm -hmm. The view of uh, uh, gang life in different stages of devolution mm -hmm. uh, was was very well done. I refused to watch the last episode because and story writing the last season kind of failed. The mm -hmm. way politicians interact with police and criminals uh, was very well done. The way these people talk to each other was extremely well done. They used a lot of extras uh, mm -hmm. from Baltimore. My son, one of my sons even went to school with one of the guys that played one of the drug dealers. Okay. Uh, th that was that was actually very well done. The, the thing with the human traffickers, the hookers, all dying of carbon monoxide poison in, uh, down in Baltimore City. That's an ongoing thing. Most Baltimore mayors sign off on gun running and human trafficking, and they get some of the proceeds for their campaign fund. Uh, uh, Pew, the woman that resigned supposedly because the FBI caught her selling a book illegally that she had written, they just let her get off for that. She was actually implicated in human trafficking through the Inner Harbor. What, which every Baltimore mayor has been involved in. Uh, you know, Baltimore politicians have been involved in the sex slave trade for a long time. Is that um, something that you would, I think we talked about this for a second in the introduction episode. Um, you would be willing to talk about, to a certain extent, for a separate episode? Yeah, if you're willing to get your podcast shut down. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. yeah. Sure. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll, uh, I, I won't, you know, use certain terms and everything like that. Yeah. I'll try to use uh, uh, vague language. And, yes. Uh, you know, I think it's worth it. I don't care if it's shut down, if it's shut down okay. or whatever. Yeah, um, I did a 64-page uh, report on that recently, which uh, okay. uh, my editor is going to end up publishing. But anyhow, the uh, – yeah. It, the, yeah, so the wire was uh, the wire was reasonably accurate. You know, there's some sensational, sensationalist yeah. things in there. Uh, but I was just checking. It, uh, it was uh, uh, I enjoyed most of it uh, uh, very much. And what they really got right was like kind of the interaction between the criminals themselves, the way they interacted with each other okay. at different levels from murder all the way down to negotiation and just palling around together uh, and, and yeah. so on. The fact that you're yeah. mostly going to be getting murdered by somebody that you're close friends with, uh, you know, was, uh, was, was well done. Uh, and they even showed how crooked the Baltimore uh, Sun reporters are. Yes, exactly. One season was, that was the focus of it. Right. So the, you know, this, so the American understanding throughout my lifetime of who commits violence upon who and what the dynamic is, is the reverse of reality. So this, for one, uh, 
Uh, then there's the fact that most Americans think of violence in terms of fighting, which is voluntary, mutual, ritualistic combat, uh, which is best understood in a sporting context. Okay, And police and media, one guy gets attacked by 15 teenagers and they will report it as a fight. OK, yeah, that's yeah. not a fight. That's an attack. OK, so you have different levels of willful obfuscation of reality by police and the press. The other thing is, is uh, aggression is totally misunderstood. Now, look, a police officer might be morally and legally justified to arrest me. But he is the aggressor, not me. OK, he yeah. is by any biomechanical or anthropological or even zoological definition, he is the predator, not me. It is not a fight, okay? It is predation, okay? This is in any of those three ways that you want to look at it. And most importantly, mechanically. Most people don't even have no idea mechanically how, how aggression even goes down. So again, they're easy to lie to. There's nobody easier to lie to than... Uh, than somebody, uh, than a suburbanite that's middle class who's never yeah. been attacked. <laughs> yeah, and okay. I agree for sure. Um, and I think a lot of audience members would agree, hopefully. Um, and I guess... Um, so we're still working on the foundation of why people don't even understand policing or know what it is. We haven't even yeah. gotten to policing I, yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know. I know. It's this this talk this talk is this talk is so good. I, I I don't care where it goes because it I mean within reason of course. Uh I, because don't there's worry. so many... I, I hate the police, so we'll get to the pigs. Don't worry. Okay, yeah. Um and let's talk because I mean it just it's flowing that way. Can you break down the mechanics of aggression? That would be useful, I think, for people like you were talking about, like people don't even understand the biomechanics with, if you will, of how, you know, let's just talk about the police. Like, how would the police engage somebody? And if you're that person, you should know this is what's happening to you in case you're wondering, you know, if that I think that would be illustrative. OK, I'll tell you, uh, this happened at about the same time that a couple of Baltimore City police officers were robbing, robbing illegal aliens. They were just arresting, robbing, and releasing illegal aliens in East Baltimore a lot, okay? And I had been stopped and followed. Sometimes cops would just follow me because I'm on foot. It's very unusual to see a Yeti on foot in a majority african-american urban environment so they assume you're just going there to buy drugs mm -hmm. okay which a lot of people that look like me that's what they would be doing in that neighborhood they'd be going there to buy drugs um you know i'm going back and forth to work but uh, there you go so yeah. i walk i walk from the inner harbor i walk two miles this is something that no white person ever does white people don't walk okay in urban environments they do not they don't take buses you try telling people this and they won't even believe you. What are you insane? Okay, so I get off the uh, number, uh, I get off the number 19 bus at the Inner Harbor the day before Y2K to walk to South Baltimore, which is a two and a half mile walk, to pick up my paycheck. Uh, it was raining when I left the house, so I'm wearing a duster, which is this greasy canvas trench coat. Uh, I walk into South Baltimore, I cross McDonald Street, and I'm walking up Riverside uh, Avenue. And this police car is following me. I ignore it. And uh, I would look down at the sidewalk at my feet. And I could see it keeping pace with me out of the corner of my right eye. And then I say, and I, I hear myself being addressed. I forget exactly how he said it. Okay. Um, but it's in the book, uh, When You're Food. It's in that book. And this guy is this big, jug-headed, uh, pale face. He's sitting with his window down. It was a warm day in late December. It was between Christmas and New Year's, almost the New Year's. And everybody thinks the world's going to end on Y2K. And uh, he, he said, uh, 
uh, where are you coming from? And I said, I just got off the bus down the inner harbor. He said, no, you didn't. He said, I just saw you over on Hanover Street. And I said, no, you didn't. I just got off the number 19 bus. He said, you don't take the bus. Well, what he was, he was reminding me that although uh, I am the N-word, that I didn't appear to be the N-word. Okay. So because, you know, pale faced people do not take buses in Baltimore in the 1990s. Didn't happen. People don't do it. I was the only one that did it other than a couple of like super low life homeless guys uh, because they're afraid of the people who do take the bus because they don't own automobiles. And this guy keeps on accusing me of just having been over on Hanover Street doing something I wasn't supposed to do. And he tells me to come up to the car. So I approach the car. I bend my knees. I pretend to be putting my hands on my knees, but I've slid my right hand into my pocket and I'm palming a razor. And I decide if this guy decides that he's going to hit me with his car door and arrest me, that he's dead, that I'm going to cut his throat. Okay, I got him. This guy's an idiot. I could have slid his throat with a straight razor I had in my pocket at any time. And I... Uh, I actually convinced this guy, you know, I gave him a bunch of details about where I live, what buses I take, what shift I work, okay, what days I can be found going up and down Riverside Park. The other cops watch me and Chuck stick fight at the park at 8.30 in the morning, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, up at Riverside Park, right at the end of the street, check me out, blah, blah, blah. I actually convinced this guy that I wasn't committing the crime he wanted me to have been committing over on Hanover Street. And which I knew wasn't the case anyhow. It was just bullshit. He was trying to get me in an argument with him so he could beat the shit out of me. He had his nightstick propped up on the passenger seat as if it was his much-loved pet. It was really bizarre. I was like, wow. And this is when a lot of cops are no longer carrying nightsticks. They're like, yeah, this guy can't wait to work me over with this thing. Uh, so he lets and me go. What? Yeah, sorry. He lets, me, he lets me go, and I continue to walk up Riverside where my cousin actually lives on Riverside. My cousin Fred actually lived on Riverside. Uh, I continue to walk up Riverside, and he still follow me. And then it occurs to me, oh, my God, this guy is going to rob me. I just told him I'm going to get my check cashed. You know, I make $560 a week. I mean, but it's just barely enough money to pay my mortgage and my wife's car payment. Yeah. She hates my guts. <laughs> so she doesn't drive me back and forth to work, right? So, uh, you know, that's the drive the kid around in. So by that time, I get to uh, uh, store number 48, which was Metro Shoppers, Ford Avenue, on Ford Avenue, right where Lawrence ends at Ford Avenue, two miles before you get to Fort McHenry, on Ford Avenue. I go in there to cash my check. And these three sluts that I work with are getting off work. These are chicks that would flirt with me when they come to work at like five o'clock in the morning. And uh, they're always trying to get me to go out to the bars with them and stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'd like to, but I'm married. You know, I mean, I've cheated on my wife enough. I don't want to go down that road again. You know, so um, they're like, hey, you know, you want to go out and, you know, and get some drinks. And they're punching out right next to the. Uh, to the courtesy counter where I'm getting my, where I'm counting my check out. And I was like, yeah, I'll go out with you, but I'm going to get in the car last. So I actually, and I stayed behind Lisa, who was this gorgeous blonde that was as tall as me and she had a gigantic ass. So I actually followed her out. So hopefully he wouldn't see me. And I ducked into the back of the car. And then about eight hours later, after I drank a whole bunch of beer and tequila, these bitches roll up in front of the townhouse I'm written in Dundalk in Baltimore County and literally roll me out of the car into the gutter in front of my wife, who's got steam coming out of her ear. She's so pissed off. Uh, but uh, I don't think we talked for like the next two years after that. Okay. But, uh, you know, that was the price I paid for not getting robbed and worked over and arrested by this cop. OK, so which is the way I saw it going down because this dude was still in the parking lot waiting to see me emerge. It wasn't enough that he saw me go in there and he could have called and checked me out with his supervising officer 
who still would have been on duty because that cop used to say hi to me and Chuck like 8.15 every morning when he came on duty. He'd have his breakfast coffee and watch us beat the shit out of each other's stick fighting after we got off work. Because our, our shift ended like 6 o'clock in the morning and the, the supervising officer would come there after he was calling us one time to arrest us for like breaking the wall in the park by beating each other up. Uh, while he had a skinhead handcuffed on the back of his uh, cruiser. He's like, hey, guys, uh, I just got a call. These two guys are stabbing each other in the park, uh, you know, and we're out there with polypropylene training knives stabbing each other. And he's like, you know, what do I call the dispatch? Well, I'm going to call the dispatcher back, and I'm going to tell her something. What do I tell her? And Chuck said, well, tell the dispatcher that I'm losing 17 to 3, all right? And he's like, yeah, see you later, dudes. And never after that, he'd watch us. So most of the local cops know us. That's the same small uh, squad that this guy is on because it wasn't a high crime area. It was a, it was a big money area, average individual income annual of $101,000 a year, according to the grocery survey that my, my boss did there. So this guy, for my money, he was there to rob me and, and get an arrest. Okay on his record, you know, Mr. Gung Ho Pig, you know, so that's just like one example of something happening with a cop, you know, out of my life, out of like 28 experiences. Yeah. Before 2016. I mean, if you were ballparking the Baltimore PD, I mean, are there cops that don't shake people down? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, basically, it goes, if you look at a police department, criminally, it profiles like the African-American community, where generally 30% of the community are involved in crime at some level. Okay? Yeah. Okay. And, you know, another 30% of them are fence sitters. Okay? Yeah. Just like, you know, they'll buy, you know, they might buy some stuff that was stolen, knowing it was stolen. Okay, but they won't go out there and steal it. And then another third, they're you know they're all Biden people. Okay, so that's that's basically your breakdown. But the problem is, if it's uh, it continues to get worse, once that's like a snapshot from like two thousand. Yeah. Okay. With the with the PD with the BPD, when I would say it's like one third crooked one-third neutral one-third straight yeah i've talked to a couple of cops that quit the bpd and the baltimore county police department because they were terrified of their co-workers because they're after you say no i'm not going to get involved in this crime or that crime after you've said that a few times now these crooked cops know that you know that they're crooked cops so now you got to be worried about when are they going to accidentally shoot me while we're doing a drug bust? Because they know that I know that they're crooked cops. Yeah, and I mean, I guess... So then it starts getting to the point where you're going to have two-thirds actively involved in crime, or one-third actively involved, and the other two-thirds involved sometimes, okay? Including yeah. uh, commanding officers and so on. I mean... And I guess my next kind of inclination or thought is that, I mean, it's amazing that there's still so many normal people, regular middle class people, suburbia people, whatever, um, that act as if this doesn't occur, even though it's been portrayed in movies since Serpico, right? Yeah. yeah. It's not like all bad all the time. You'll get a crooked cop. Okay. That's going to he's going to pull over a good looking girl, threaten to lock her up for speeding unless she gives him a blow job. OK, that same guy will lay down his life trying to defend an old lady. OK, mm-hmm. because in his view, he's not a bad guy. Yeah. OK, all women are sluts. So why not use them for I mean, because most cops have a low opinion of women. So the uh, the other thing is, is they lie a lot because they believe everybody lies because they deal with criminals so much. They're constantly dealing with people that lie a lot. So they develop this very cynical view of the world where everybody's a liar. So I might as well lie too. But there's, for the most part, it's only cool to commit crimes against criminals. And it used to, to a certain degree, criminals will still hold to that ethos where, you know, there's a good number of criminals that will not go out there and beat up an old lady. 
that this you didn't start to see a lot of violent crime against elderly pale people, for instance, in Baltimore until after BLM or bacon, lettuce and tomato, the bacon, lettuce and tomato advertisements. When those advertisements started for that sandwich, then that started to result in elderly people who were egg white people, uh, you know, the egg McMuffin people getting attacked by the teenagers because it was now OK, because you, based on the condition of your birth, you're now 100 percent evil. All right. So that um, traditionally, you know, I've been given pass by a pass by a lot of people who knew I was not involved in crime. I was not a drug buyer. OK, I was not a snitch. I was not a cop. This happened in uh, uh, December of 2019. I actually walked by a huddle of 10 hardcore criminals, one of whom in the blue sweatshirt carries the gun. And he gave me a pass. Two of the guys in this crew tried to rob me as parts of packs a couple of different times. They couldn't get the deal done. I stood them off. And then they all talked to each other about me. And I knew this because when the gun carrier saw me, he nodded with his chin to me coming up the alley behind them right before dark when they're having their planning session to the leader. The leader, before he turned around and looked at me, said something. And the other nine guys all hung their heads like gargoyles under their hoods. And he looked at me and he gave me a nod of respect that basically let me know I had a truce. I already knew I had a personal truce with a gun carrier because him and I were both approached by the same group of predatory Latino criminals at the same night, five minutes apart, 50 yards apart. And he stayed and watched to see what my interaction was going to be with them because he was if I was a cop, he was going to find out if I was a drug buyer, he was going to find out. OK. If I was just a weirdo, semi-homeless dude, he was going to find out. He found that out. He gave me a pass. And one of these guys back in May actually saved me from a new hitter that they recruited who was going to beat me up just to establish street cred. And one of the guys in this huddle actually stepped forward and kept that from going down. So I did not have to rip this guy's guts out in front of this porch load of lower middle class white people who would have called the cops on me immediately. And then I had to stab a cop in the neck and get shot to death. OK, so th this group of guys, I ended up developing a truce with a pretty hardcore group of criminals that have done a lot of violent crimes, are running drugs, are in active opposition against the Baltimore County Police Department. Guess who shows me violent intentions while I got a truce with these a truce with these guys, which is a standoff. You're across the street. Stay away from me. Truce. Baltimore County Police, they are eye-fucking me while I'm sitting on my landlady's porch drinking a beer 50 feet off the road. The cops swelling down and grilling me. Okay. Because they just, they're wondering what your role is in all this, essentially. Like, if, if did they not understand that you're just a guy that works for a living? <laughs> I'm a guy that's, I'm a guy that's not afraid to be sitting on the porch and I'm white. And yeah. that's dangerous. Okay. That's the way they're saying it. I'm supposed to be holed up inside. So this is when the cops switched over to enforce social distancing in that area. Yeah. Okay, because that cop, no police officer comes back in that neighborhood after dark. This guy's got to come back right before dinner time or right after dinner time before the sun sets to you it know, reminds me. threaten me with his eyes. Yeah. It reminds me of um, like when I've seen like video of um, prison riots where sometimes it, it seems confusing from the outside looking in when you'll see guys in, you know, gang affiliated or whatever in hardcore prisons where they, there'll be a correction officer that they don't uh, jump or beat the shit out of or kill. And they kind of protect him and, you know, in a way like another level of your incident and your experience where they, you know what I mean? Like they, they, they're like, they'll literally throw the guy under the table and kind of make sure that he doesn't get fucking stabbed or killed. Uh, and it makes me wonder if, if it's just that, that correction uh, officer wasn't a psychopath and treated the inmates with a modicum of respect or something. I don't know. Or he wasn't treating them with, uh, with respect or according to an honor code. 
uh, you know, the, uh, I trained a guy that was uh, a corrections officer. And this guy, like, beat the shit out of, like, 30 big Bantu warriors in the joint. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he even beat the crap out of a couple of them while he was alone in a cage with 20 of their buddies. Good Lord. And, and what do they do? They all stand back. Oh, you done done it now, son. Oh, oh, the white devil be bringing it down on your ass. <laughs> <laughs> and they're standing there pointing fingers at him, laughing at him. While, while my boy's like, you know, body slamming the guy, putting him in a grapevine. <laughs> Hammer yeah. rock, here you go. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Is, and that... uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's there's it, when you're dealing with real violent criminals, there is usually some sort of honor code. Unless they're really young. And The Wire demonstrates that well in the last series, yeah, in yeah. the last season, yeah. where yeah. the really, the ones that are really super lethal are like the younger teenagers. Yeah, and that makes sense because their damn prefrontal cortex isn't developed till you're like 26 or something. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, so it's, there's crooked cops have a code. There's certain civilians you leave alone. Just like crooks. Yeah, I mean, you have code, and there's certain civilians you leave alone. And so I think it would be, a, a, I guess, at this point to maybe go a little bit into um, how, before we come back full circle to today's you know, time period, I'd like to just talk a little bit about how, yeah, you have. Um, like we've talked about in the beginning, how you're going to usually see violence committed, you know, predation violence on uh, a, a person or a group of people that are weaker uh, yeah. or don't have the technology or don't have the skill or whatever to fight. Um, and if you look in American history and you look at, say, <clears throat> post-Civil War and you're at like the coal – like those um, coal and iron police in Pennsylvania and the Pinkertons and these kind of independent contractors. Um, and I was yeah, how they put down uh, workers. Um, Let's use Pennsylvania as an example of the development of law enforcement. In okay. Is that good for you? Yeah, it's good. Because it's the first place where you get a, a solid police department. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. So the first law enforcement in Pennsylvania were the Delaware Indians, who were a mixed race confederation of Indians who immediately made a truce with William Penn. And you can see the early paintings of this truce. And these Indians look like the bad guys in the Road Warrior. Okay. Who are we kidding here? Uh, at this point, when William Penn sits down, European sailors, whalers, slave traders, uh, kitchen cutlery traders, and explorers have been plying the Atlantic seaboard for 200 years. Okay, so it's no, it's no surprise to see very pale-looking, you know, mohawked, road warrior-looking guys signing a treaty with uh, this dumpy little William Penn church boy. Okay, so between uh, 16 between the 1690s and the 1740s the only armed body there were only two armed bodies in pennsylvania there was the very tiny minority of uh christians who owned people and also owned guns then there was then there were the tribes the indian tribes uh, Pennsylvania was a backwater, not a homeland for most of them. It, it, a lot of similarities to Kentucky where not a lot of them lived there all the time, but a lot of them would hunt there, including hunting people. Uh, the Delaware were the slave catchers. So generally speaking, there was one free Christian or Old Testament person for every 20 people that he owned. And that man would have a gun. That was enough to defend himself. That doesn't put him in a position to go chasing you down when you run away. So in return for guns and gunpowder, the Delaware will get your pale ass and bring you back 
And for every day you spent running away, you're going to have a month or a week added to your time served. Basically, this is a period in Pennsylvania in the late 1600s and through most of the 1700s where the vast majority of people are Christians who are convict laborers. That's what they are. They're owned by another person. That person has a weapon to defend themselves, but they have uh, that they, they don't have anybody else hanging out that's got a gun. OK, that's going to be able to help them go catch shoes. So they employ the Indians for this. Now, the French and Indian War destroyed this because uh, most of the Delaware chiefs got so uh, irritated with the Quakers for selling their young men liquor and setting them crazy and getting them addicted to this drug and ripping them off in trade negotiations that they took French money and attacked these British subjects on behalf of the French. And uh, out of uh, perhaps 500 Delaware, only 60 of them sided with the Quakers in Philadelphia. One of the chiefs gave all these Quaker politicians a speech. He said, I only have 60 warriors. You have to arm some of your men. Your men can no longer be completely unarmed. They are going to have to take up the hatchet for you and fight the enemy because I don't have enough warriors to do it. So this is the beginning of a militia presence. A guy named Peter Williamson was recruited into one of the very first Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania militias. Now, this is for external security against the Indians, who used to be the external and internal security. Now you have militia and some Indians as your external security. And for internal security, the goer, the jailer, it's spelled goer, but it's pronounced jailer, is going to end up ranging the road with some assistants who will end up being called slave catchers in the future. And if you don't have freedom papers and if you don't have both parts of your uh, indented uh, servant release form, OK, then you'll just be uh, an ad will be put in the paper uh, and every uh, three months there's an auction where uh, people that are picked up without papers are auctioned off. If you don't redeem your runaway before them, uh, then the jailer sells them and he uses that for his salary and to cover jailing expenses and for food for the people that he's for these for, for the people that he's holding. At this period of time, there were almost no unfree African-Americans in Pennsylvania. It was almost all uh, servile labor was European-American. Uh, so uh, the crisis point where police force is actually needed is when you are holding, uh, w once you develop industrial uh, labor forces, which means coal mining, they already had iron foundries. There was a big problem in 1775 in Maryland and Pennsylvania with uh, men working in gangs and iron foundries who were shackled actually doing uprisings and breakouts. This happened like a year before the revolution. The uh, Afterwards, a lot of these people that would normally be held as uh, these slaves in iron foundries are now actually given guns, and they're uh, they're given uh, they're given opportunities to be frontiersmen and go fight the Shawnee and take some of their land. That's a whole different story, but the uh, that takes a lot of internal pressure. You're allowing these tens of thousands of uh, runaways, former slaves, and so forth to go down the Ohio River at great risk to risk to life and limb and start their own life. And down the road, that's going to give you a taxable base as an expanding government entity. Uh, but by the time the uh, Civil War starts, uh, and, and by the time the Civil War is over, in 1865, one of the first new laws put in, this is before the 14th Amendment, which people think ended slavery, and it did not. It just re-statutized uh, slavery as something that can only be inflicted upon a felon which was originally the idea with the settlement of America is that we're going to send all of our criminals here as slave waiver. So th that's all they did was they just, uh, uh, they just, uh, the 14th amendment, when you read it, that has nothing to do about race. And the only qualification is, is it's not legal to enslave anybody unless they've been convicted of a crime. Now, in, uh, 
1865, three years before uh, the bogus 14th Amendment supposedly frees the slaves, uh, three years before the state of Pennsylvania permits private corporations, uh, railroads, coal mines, and uh, iron founders to write their own laws and put in place their own police forces, which is where you get the coal and mining police. And as a reaction to this, you get these criminal gangs. One of them is called the Molly McGuire's, which was an Irish iteration of it. And then that brings in the need something like the Pinkertons, which is going to be a detective agency that's going to infiltrate the criminal gangs. It's going to work on both sides of the criminal legal fence. And to such a degree that it becomes like the lead U.S. intelligence agency on the side of the Union during the war between the states. So that's basically where you get your uh, where modern law enforcement in its urban iteration. OK, and this is totally different from the idea of the sheriff, which is an elected official and the local men that elect him agree to form his deputies in time of need when he's got to go take care of a violent criminal. He's a leader and he's uh, he's uh, dealing with law abiding citizens that are going to be his deputies and they're consenting to trust him as a moderator. And there's a TV show called Longmire uh, that's set in Wyoming uh, that actually shows like how a sheriff works in this way, that he needs the cooperation of the armed citizenry to work. That's totally different from urban and suburban law enforcement which is based on putting in place a force that's going to serve as a union busting mechanism. They're first going to be employed by private actors uh, like the coal, coal mines and uh, the railroads. And then eventually they'll be that cost will be borne by the taxpayer. Once you resettle a bunch of these people in an actual city, uh, those industrial workers are now going to foot the bill for the police that are used to beat the shit out of them whenever they go on strike. Okay, so the modern municipal police department is a way of taking something like the coal and iron police and funding it by the government, which is funded by tax dollars, in order to beat the shit out of taxpaying workers. Okay, to keep them in line to serve the elite. And then uh, uh, you could say whatever you need to, and then we could go to the increased... Uh, evolution of the urban police department away from that towards something else yeah and it's interesting that the pinkerton the guy that started it of all things was a you know he, i think he was living in like illinois or something that was like the west frontier in the 40s 1840s and he kind of happened upon um counterfeiters of all things and got involved in getting these people that were making counterfeit money, even though he was just a cooper, a barrel maker. And that led into um, being an investigator, detective, what have you. And then, yeah, you know, by the 1850s, developing this whole organization. And then through, you know, the Civil War, when he started getting more industrialized and dealing with the the uh, iron and railroad strikes and stuff like that. A lot of people don't realize that in 1877, there was this huge strike that was like freaking all the big wigs and elites out. Um, but it's interesting that, I mean, you said that, yeah, it's like with a, with a regular sheriff, it's, it's the opposite of, a standing police force, you know, it's, you got one guy in a County and, you know, if he needs deputies, he deputizes people and those people are from the community. And so there, it's kind of built into that um, system to where it kind of, I would think does a decent job of preventing outright corruption. You know, obviously it occurred, but you're not going to have it to the degree. It's, interest, it's interesting that corrupt policing through American film has mostly been portrayed as happening amongst rural sheriffs, not in the urban environments where it's been endemic since New York in the 1840s. Okay. Because yeah. uh, New York's got an even earlier, 
you know, history of policing in Pennsylvania. And, and where you're talking about political bullies, people that are in charge of splitting heads at election time, you know, so uh, it's the, like you said before that that cities in, in some talk at some point, you said that basically um, cities are essentially made for slaves. <laughs> well, it the, the, in Plantation America, uh, the cities were places where the elite and their servants lived mm -hmm. and a small artisan class of people that were successful. And usually they owned a couple of servants. OK, yeah. uh, it would be, you know, a, a printer, a guy that ran a printing press. He's going to have a couple of people that are his slaves that help him with the printing presses and, and so on. So. The free people that that uh, do not operate businesses are going to flee the city because there's no wage labor for them. Uh, from the mid 1500s until the early 1800s, a day's labor got you one shilling. Okay, totally stagnant wages, one shilling. That's what it got you. After a year. How many shillings is that? Uh, 365, let's say. 365 shillings a year if you're going to pay a guy to ditch for you or do odd jobs for you every year. If you buy for, uh, if you buy for 100 shillings, if you buy some Irish boy for 100 shillings, which is about a normal rate, I think it's going to be like five pounds, you own that guy for four to seven years. If you buy him as a boy, you might own him for 21 or 31 years. And we'll get so into what are you, Yeah, so what are you going to do? Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so there, that's why the working class people are leaving the cities and you don't have large, prosperous cities. The only city in the American South on the eve of the war, of, uh, the war between the states that had a decent population was Baltimore. And Baltimore had many anti-slave ordinances in the city that were put in place in the late 1700s due to African-American crime problems that they had there. Now, the uh, so the slave economy selects for a small city populated by the elite, a small free artisan class and slaves. Once you have an industrial revolution, once it's once America becomes an industrial nation and it's no longer just a resource extraction location for the British mercantile system. Now, these cities are going to become industrial centers because you've got to move everything that's not being moved by rail needs to move by water. And even the railroads are built along waterways. If you take the railroads today, every one of them traces a river when you're in the east, because that's how you built. The, that's how you move those heavy timbers and that iron was by the water. So uh, now you've got to invite all of these scumbags whose great granddaddies, grandfathers and fathers fled the plantation system when they finally got free or when they just ran away. Now you've got to invite this white trash back into your beautiful city. Okay, so this is where you have the need for a police force. So the coal and iron police were described as being over six feet tall and over 200 pounds at a time when the world heavyweight champion was 165 pound uh, uh, Fit, Fitzsimmons from New Zealand. OK, mm -hmm. Jack Johnson, the most dominant heavyweight champion of the age was Big Cat Johnson, 204 pounds. Uh, James J. Jeffries, six feet tall, 210 pounds. OK. Uh, uh, James J. Corbett, 184 pounds, heavyweight champion of the world. The average coal and mining policeman is over six feet tall and over 200 pounds. And he rides a very large military horse and he has a gun and he has a truncheon. He's got this hand club. And at the very same time, most of your prime athletes are under 160 pounds. Your coal miners are 130 to 150 pound men that are virtually dying of starvation and working 14 hours a day. So what would this be like? This would be like your office cubicle worker being policed 
be forced to work for free because these coal miners didn't get paid in money. They essentially work for credit at a company supply store. And one of my relatives on my ex-wife's side actually wrote a book called Always in a Hole about this was her uncle that wrote this book about her father's life as basically a miner and being subject to these coal and mining police. So imagine if there's no NFL and everybody in the NFL is a cop and their job is to kick your ass anytime you disobey the company that you work for. That's what it was to be a working guy in a rural Pennsylvania coal mining town, in an iron town, in a railroad town, or, okay, and they were called railroad bulls. Their job was to beat the shit out of little kids and hobos in the railroad yards, okay? Or it was what it was like to be an early industrial worker anywhere in the United States where the police were basically big thugs that their job was to beat your ass. Uh, my favorite serial killer, his name is Pansram. He was a homosexual rapist who claims to have raped about a thousand men and killed a couple dozen of them. And nobody's been able to disprove any of his crimes. And he was a total psychopath. For a while, he was one of these cops. He was, you put, look up a picture, picture of this guy when he was in Leavenworth. And this guy is looking into the camera with hate for the world. Okay. This guy eventually was beat up by a gang of workers because he got caught by himself in the saloon by like 30 of the dudes that typically he beat the shit out of. Okay. So this is what the cops were. They were brought into your town because, uh, you, you have, uh, your your lower class is actually small in these cities. So now the where the rich people live is actually in the cities. So what happens in a city like Baltimore around the turn of the century is you got this police source of these big brutal thugs keeping your your union workers in line. And now the elite people, the rich people, they are building orchard houses. They're building big mansions outside of town where they can go live in the hills in the summertime, so they're, so they're not all hot in these houses. H.L. Mencken writes about this a lot. I rented a room for eight years in one of these old mansions, uh, you know, in the early part of this last decade uh, in Baltimore City, in northeast Baltimore. So you have, you have these elite people sharing space with these working class scum. Well, what happens when the factories start to shut down? When you're offsourcing your uh, factory work to, let's say, the Midwest, uh, and you're taking it out of the eastern cities, and then you're sending it overseas. Well, what happens is the elite now want to get rid of all these working class scumbags of European descent, which they've always hated more than anybody. So what they do is they invite rural people of African-American descent from the South into their cities. And when these people end up having tribal conflicts with the, conflicts with the local white trash, Guess who wins every time the local white trash win because there are more of them. They're better organized. You know, they work They're industrial industrial workers are nasty people to get into a gang fight with. it's worse than getting in a gang fight with a farm boy. Right. So mm -hmm. they win and the cops are there to take the side of and rescue the uh, the rural African-American transplants in the city. And then finally, when you have uprisings in the 1960s that. Uh, are planned by the government. They're planned by the creep state in 1968, the same year that you have a law that makes it a federal hate crime for European American to successfully defend themselves against an African American. In that very same year, the Baltimore City Police Department wants East Baltimoreans, which is where the ethnic uh, European American uh, uh, population fought back against. Uh, the African-American death squads in the 1968 riots. And I knew people that were involved in this. Uh, once they successfully fought back, the police came in and shut them down. The National Guard came in and shut them down. And what this permits is uh, by having the police take the side in riots and civil unrest of the African-Americans. Uh, but then when there's no riots, beating the crap out of the African-Americans and blaming it on, you know, uh, European-Americans, you build this vast animosity on the side of the African-Americans 
which once they move into proximity with European Americans, makes them highly prone to retributive violence because they feel like every time they got beat up by a European American cop, he was doing it for the European American working man. When in fact, he's also beating the crap out of the European American working man. He's doing it because he's a working man. He's doing it to the black guy because he's the black guy because he's there to engender that racial bitterness so that then you can unleash another wave of a wave of race-based violence, violent mob uprisings in the 90s and the teens. You know, so it's just a way of flipping real estate because the African American population cannot survive economically without the European American population. Once they've uh, driven all the European Americans out of their neighborhood, it's now a food desert. There's nobody that can operate a business. And they have to follow wherever the European Americans that they chased out of the neighborhood fled to. And then that opens it up for gentrification. And the end goal is to have a European style city where all the rich white people live in the middle with their pets of color. And then the white trash is in the rural areas. And then there's a ring of colored ghettos around the city. That's the ultimate hope of the U.S. And the police are there to facilitate that. Yeah, and so we're now, and for a while, I guess, been driving um, driving people out of the city, you know, the white working class, right. into the suburbs and into the rural areas, back into the rural areas. And but I mean, it's a little. There's a little bit of a a twist there. Because in the 90s and in the 2000s, you had this – people tried to gentr- – gentrification occurred in a lot of cities. Like in – I'm not going to say where I'm from or where I know, but there's uh, been that you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, and where you've had people that are you know, hippies, yuppies, um, and hipsters or whatever you want to call them. People that are not necessarily, you know, making tons of money, but are making good money, uh, wanting to move into the chic areas of the city again, you know, and they kind of blame it on the, it's like, oh, the crack epidemic or whatever in the 80s, you know, depopulated the city, and then, you know, meanwhile we've had, we've had continual drug cycles, you know, my entire life, whether it's been heroin or meth or whatever but then it's like people it's like now that <laughs> there's people that are that have before the pandemic and before these recent uh riots and protests throughout this past year you know it, people want to go to the city even if they're not really managerial class people and <laughs> so they're going to be but now recently here, very recently, you see all these people trying to get out of the city. Um, every, na- every, gentr- every one of the five neighborhoods gentrified in Baltimore City has failed, including <laughs> South Baltimore, which is where that cop, Jim Bob, I think I called him, uh, was going to rob me. That succeeded for 10 years. And then mm-hmm. as soon mm-hmm. as they Art. drove all of the original rednecks out, the reason Baltimore... South Baltimore, it's a peninsula. There's only three ways to get into it. It was the only neighborhood. It was the only Caucasian neighborhood that successfully defended itself during the 1968 riots. Okay. And it was in 1980, it was a white trash neighborhood. You'd walk down Riverside Avenue in 1980 and see fat women with dirty feet sitting in front of open front doors with no screen, uh, you know, with a bed on the living room floor, with just a mattress on the living room floor. That's how trashy it was. People like my brother and my cousin and my girlfriend, uh, they moved in there. They bought these houses for a song. Uh, they rehabbed them, and then they sold them for about 250 in the 1990s. And then in the early aughts, those same houses were selling for 500 So this was all made possible by the reputation that South Baltimore had as the place where the rough hillbillies live. So the brothers didn't go in there. But finally, every one of those guys got driven out by the tax. The, the, tals, the taxes went up so high 
that my buddy Tim, who inherited his house from his mother, who inherited it from her father, this house that the granddad had bought for $5,000 in the 1960s, Tim's annual taxes were now over $10,000 for this house. And he's working on a supermarket night crew. He can't afford it anymore. So he's got to move over to Brooklyn. He can't live there anymore, which means there's no longer anybody to protect these hipsters from the thugs when they come into the neighborhood. So in 2014, the thugs started coming into South Baltimore. The first thing they did was stab an off-duty uh, Baltimore City homicide detective outside of a bar. Okay, And since then, there's been like three civilians, three upper middle class civilians every year are being carjacked and killed in South Baltimore. So now people are leaving South Baltimore uh, after the housing values topped out at around a half a million for a row home uh, that was going for five thousand dollars back in the 1960s. So your uh, uh, that's the only neighborhood that it was actually successful. The semi successful neighborhood is Canton, and it's only semi successful because you got 20,000 Latinos defended by MS-13 between uh, the Perkins Homes Projects and Canton in Old Fells Point. So in that case, the Latinos are eradicating the African-Americans and they're actually defending uh, the, the hipster elite uh, pale faces on the waterfront in Canton. So it's where you can make, when you have that density of... Uh, of your uh, of your ebony population, and it's that criminalized. Yeah, those are the people that you needed to get rid of all that white trash and run them out of your city. But now the only people that can shut them down are like large scale Latino crime syndicates because the cops can't do it. The cops get right in bed with the thugs, and they be, and, and to begin with, most Baltimore City cops are African American themselves who have relatives that are professional criminals. So. Uh, the only people that can clean this mess up really are the Latinos. And so I, I would think that would put the city council and everything, the elites or whatever, kind of in a precarious situation because it's like, who do they want to win? The Latinos or the blacks or. Well, they pretend that the Latinos aren't killing any of their sated pets because mm -hmm. the Latinos do not exist in the standard Eastern upper middle class uh, elite mindset. The Latinos just don't exist. They're invisible. They've got their own side-by-side -side economy going on and everything. Um, mm -hmm. They're working with working class. White guys are almost extinct and so on. So uh, they just try to ignore it. That's why they started fudging all the numbers on the race of murder victims in East Baltimore because it's basically Latino guys slaughtering African-American guys, which happens everywhere where the Latino criminals come in. They pretty much leave the whites alone and they attack the blacks. Okay. So what do you think will happen with that when I kind of agree that with your overall thesis that elites want a city uh, with a small number of uh, mostly white elites living in the city center with outward rings of ghettos essentially, um, but they also want to use certain ethnic groups as their – uh, you know, propaganda pieces and whatnot. Uh, I just think that it's like they may have stepped into something they don't quite well, know. Yeah. You know. It's not it's not some master plan. It's a desire of many people in the legal and real estate business and in government to achieve certain things. And some of their desires are at cross purposes. So you end up with a mess and what you're and you're resulting underclass is it's going to be non-European American, okay? And more and more, it's going to be drawn from the third world. The African American population is currently being used to move uh, middle class European Americans out of the suburbs mm -hmm. and so that the African Americans can colonize the suburbs. Yeah. Okay, Because and that's the way. So... You, you use the African-American stick along with the suburban carrot to get your European-American working class and middle class out of the cities. Yes. Now you're going to use the suburban carrot. Yeah. OK. Uh, and the Latino stick. OK. Yeah. And the African stick. You know, African-Americans yeah. don't like Africans. They hate them. And the Middle Eastern stick. They hate Middle Easterns. And the Asian stick. They hate Asians. 
you're going to use these various ethnic third world sticks and the suburban pale carrot to get your African-Americans out of the cities. But they're stubborn and it's not totally going to work. So you're always going to have these certain ghetto African-American enclaves in American cities, which I think is a beautiful thing because it's going to keep the plan from being perfect because yeah. it's not a unified plan. It's a bunch of different plans that are basically only have one common goal, which is the total eradication of working class European Americans. That is the only common thread yeah. in elite European American psychology from the beginning of this country till now into the future. The only common thread is elite Europeans absolutely hate working Europeans. Because they have some form of – because, you yeah, know, whether you're talking about the frontier or you're talking about the countryside now or you're talking about real middle-class people, they have some autonomy. And that brings us oh. – yeah, the, the main it, reason why it, the hatred, the main reason for the hatred is that somebody that looks like them, okay, uh, that visually could replace them, could marry their wife, okay? <laughs> All right. And, yeah. and on the other hand, if you look at every government that's been taken down on this planet. OK. Uh, number two in the running is Mongols. OK. They've taken down more governments than anybody except for working class people of European descent. OK. <laughs> yeah. All right. So if you're in power, the last thing you want is a bunch of feral peril faces running around that aren't in some kind of prison program. Uh, I mean, you can't let these people anywhere near power because they've proven time and again that they can take down governments all over the world. After all, that's who you use to take down governments every other year or so, is these guys. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, whether it's British foreign policy or United States foreign policy throughout the well, past 200 well, years. Right. So two times Lower Egypt was successfully attacked by Bantus out of Upper Egypt. OK, mm -hmm. two times and two times in human history, there is, you know, that happened in Egypt, for instance. There has mm -hmm. never been a successful military operation out of Africa to conquer any place outside of Africa ever. So these aren't the people that you want to use. To impose your will. Yeah. Now. They did. They used them to put uh, European Americans out of work. That's why they were brought over. That's why 330,000 of them were brought over was to put people like me and you out of work, to put our ancestors out of work so that we had to go fight the Indians because we couldn't get a job, you know. Uh, and then they were used to drive us out of our homes and put us out of work, you know, in, in this last uh, century and a half, you know. But they're not people you can use to actually go do military conquest unless there's a police force in place that's going to make sure I can't carry a sword with me or you can't carry a gun with you. Yeah. All right. You know, that's, that's it. So that's why the police are there. You know, when I had to leave my house at night, am I going to stuff this sold off 20 gauge under my duster thinking that the homeboys are finally going to come at me in force? No, or I, am yeah. I not going to do it because I'm thinking the cops are going to shake me down tonight? I used to have to look in the mirror and, and roll these dice before I went to work. Yeah, that's a hell of a thing. Am I going to slide the, the belly knife between my belt and my jock strap behind my back and then, and then wrap a flannel shirt around my hips? Mm -hmm. Thinking that the homeboys are finally just going to go for broke? Or am I thinking, you know what? I think maybe a cop might pull me over tonight for the crime of being a pale face on foot. <laughs> it makes you want to like maybe work uh, somewhere else <laughs> if you're going to work. <laughs> it, yeah. So you're, you're, and, and it's if you and two pale faces on foot in a majority black, black city, forget that. If there's a cop around, he, he's shaking you down. He's hassling. You. He's pulling over. Hey, chief. Hey, chief. Where are you from, chief? No, you're not from there, chief. I know where you're from. Where are you going, chief? Who do you know, chief? Your grandma live here, chief? Show me your house. You know, this is the kind of shit you're going to get. Okay, if you're a working class, uh, you know, pale face in any city that's even 30% African, that's what the white cop's going to do to you. That's his job, is to harass the shit out of you 
make sure you can't successfully defend yourself. Make sure you're alone and you're unarmed so a pack of five or six Bantus can run you down and beat your ass because then that moves real estate. Because once you can't defend yourself, it's obvious you can't defend your wife and kids, so you got to move. So there goes your mortgage. I left the mortgage behind. I walked away from my house. Okay. Yeah. You know. If I had to ask a, a tactical type question um, before we close up and start talking about, I thought we would finish with talking about where this pandemic is leading us as far as uh, development of policing. But before that, I wanted to ask what um, it, it's really shocking to me how many people, the no knock warrants and also um, killing people's dogs um, just for no reason. And uh, I want to know your thoughts on, you know, I'm sure it's a simple reason or a simple answer, but I had to ask you like, you know, if the cops come into my house, I have dogs and they're going to, they're going to kill my dogs, aren't they? Yeah, your dogs, your dogs are dead. Yeah. And, and they'll, shoot fact, you in, they'll shoot you in your bed. Yeah. You know. Is it just a, like, they don't want to deal with the dogs. It's like, fuck it. You know, basically it's too much of a problem. We'll write the paperwork afterwards. I mean, it's, and even though dogs usually aren't that aggressive, even if they're, I mean, you have to really train dogs to really do something to somebody. Yeah. But it's part of the whole psychology. It's the, I don't care if it's, uh, you know, uh, I don't care if they're like Iron Age savages, mm -hmm. okay, or it's a SWAT team. They're going to whack the dogs, okay, because they, yeah, they don't know the dog, you know. Yeah. Uh, there's, you know, uh, it's, you know, you're just going to whack it. Uh, it's going to be one one less variable. Um, yeah. The um, the way the United States conducts wars overseas is almost exactly the way police departments have conducted the drug war in the United States for your entire lifetime, which is 4.45 in the morning, kicking in a door. Hmm. 10 on one, tactical gear on underwear. Okay? <laughs> yeah. You know, you're in your underwear, and these guys are body armored. They got night vision equipment. They're screaming at you. 10 dudes with machine guns. Uh you know, I've seen these caravans rolling into neighborhoods before when I was taking the bus home because I used to get the bus at like between 4.30 and 5 o'clock in the morning to go home for my night job. Uh, I had a girlfriend that uh, was a bookkeeper in, in a ghetto store. And every morning she followed the SWAT caravan into town every morning. Every morning she swallowed the, followed the SWAT caravan into town. I talked to one uh, Baltimore City narcotics cop who came from uh, he was uh, uh, trained by Norris, the guy that took over at Baltimore City Police Department and who used to run uh, uh, the police department in New York for Giuliani. Uh, and in the early 1990s, he told me that he had already kicked in, not kicked in, but used a ram on 711 doors in Baltimore City. And he said, you know what? A lot of these people were totally innocent. We just got a tip from like some drug dealer that had his girlfriend call a neighbor and say they were the drug dealer selling drugs out of that neighborhood. So you got a guy that's waking up that might figure that the drug dealer across the street sent in some people dressed up as cops to kill him. And he might yeah. fight back because yeah. we don't know when we have a good. So he said, we're, we're scared to death coming in that door because one day somebody's going to try to defend himself. Yeah. You know, he's like, you know, he said it's really hairy. It's scary, but it's big game hunting. It's hunting the lion in his lair. It's not sporting. OK, but it's how you do it with minimal risk. And it's. Um, uh, the urban experience, a ton of experience has been had in Iraq. Uh, and the rural experience, a ton of experience has been had in Afghanistan. So if you want to see what it's going to be like living in the Rocky Mountains and not wanting to take your gun in to the checkpoint to turn in your firearms, uh, watch the Mark Wahlberg mover, movie Lone Survivor, which is a real story, uh, you know, uh, about a, a guy uh, that was the last survivor of a Navy SEAL unit that got, uh, that got hosed in Afghanistan. Watch the last hour, half hour of that, which is all totally made up and didn't happen in the book. 
but it's basically your American military fantasy of how to take out a rural village with helicopter gunships, okay, and uh, and uh, vertical infiltration of special ops infantry, okay. Look at the last half hour of that. That's the way it's going to run out in the Rocky Mountains when they start. Uh, you know, they're they're going to start with gunsmiths. Anybody that's got a gunsmithing light license, anybody that's got a record of buying reloading equipment, these people are just silently going to be arrested. And if the arrest does make the news, they're just going to list how many guns this guy had. And if you got a gun for Christmas every year, over 40 years, because he's a hunter, well, then it's going to, to a normal suburbanite. It's going to seem like he was a dangerous psychopath, right? So all they're going to do is list, is list all the stuff that was recovered, and everybody's going to assume that he was a... An, uh, a domestic terrorist. So most of this work will be done by large scale paramilitary law enforcement and by military contractors. I was harassed and threatened by military contractors during the Baltimore purge in 2015, uh, which was called the riots then. And it's called like a protest or uprising now, but it was actually a purge. Uh, so military contractors are uh, from Katrina to, you know, to Minneapolis this year. There were military contractors on the ground using guns in Minneapolis, you know, during the, during the riots last year. You know, the military contractors are going to play parts as uh, as cadres, as paramilitary cadres to really kick shit off uh, in different uh, urban unrest operations, which are going to clear territory and loose up real estate much more quickly than the, you know, seven decade long you know, insertion of African-Americans into the urban sphere, which turned out to be very ugly, and that needs to be fixed. So they're going to use uh, these uh, these professional agitators, these military contractors, more and more for that. And uh, more and more, the, the drug war that's been waged against uh, with using two SWAT teams apiece to go after one guy in his bed at 4.45 in the morning, that is now going to be a bad thinker, a gun owner, a Christian, uh, you know, a Caucasian. Uh, it's going to be somebody whose ex-wife calls up and triggers a red flag warrant because she's afraid maybe uh, that, uh, you know, that he's a danger, okay, because he doesn't want her getting gang-banged by the local high school football team in front of his five-year-old son or whatever it is, you know, uh, this is this is going to be where that's going to go. So all that law enforcement practice and all that overseas military practice going after the one guy, killing like Osama bin Laden, that guy, the way they killed him, you, zero dark thirty. You can uh, you can watch the uh, the Osaron uh, interview on uh, sixty minutes that was conducted uh, when uh, President Frothy Latte, you know, announced the death of this bad actor. That's that guy. There's no accident that he's an Aryan, that he's a Caucasian, that Osama bin Laden was essentially, uh, you know, uh, a single guy in a house full of women, <laughs> you know, uh, with maybe some children in it that's being attacked by like 15 of the most highly trained professional murderers on the planet. OK, while he's in bed and some of his wives are getting whacked in the process. And he's being made fun of, okay, and his body's being desecrated at the same time. That is what, you know, uh, the pale face of the future in America who does not have the brains to keep his mouth shut and who believes all the bullshit in the Constitution and Bill of Whites, that's going to be that guy. If he doesn't wise up and go underground and stop complaining and thinking that his vote matters, uh, that's going to be him. You know, so that's why I think it's going... And the medical, the, the pandemic, shamdemic, pandemic stuff, that's going to be uh, private law enforcement connected with medical. You're going to have doctors basically triggering no-knock medical violation warrants on con based on contact tracing reports, based on Zoom and Skype interviews with patients. You know, when I was with the lady I was renting a room from in May, she was she had an online doctor's appointment and the doctor spent 15 minutes interrogating her about me. Who was this person? Has he been tested? 
Is he showing symptoms? What is his name? Where is he from? What state did he come from? Did he quarantine in that state? Who else has he been in contact with? Yeah. And I told her, I said, okay, I won't be living here next year. Okay, because next year, that might be, you know, that might trigger a no-knock warrant. That might trigger at least a female cop coming to the front porch to get me in an argument so that a couple of male cops can come and beat the shit out of me and haul me off. Okay? Uh, the guys in the white coats will be coming to your house directly from the medical facility in the future based on that. So that's one of the ways that's going to interact uh, with this. And I have talked with some law enforcement people during this whole process with the riots and the shamdemics and all, if you want to go over any of that before we go. Sorry for running on there, but... Uh, no, it's uh, good. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it. I wanted to tie it into right now a bit because, like I said, I don't typically talk about current events that much, but I, I do want to talk about this um, for this podcast. Well, this is ancient history. This was like a, almost a year ago. This is America. Yeah. You know, we, have a, you know, we have a five-day, uh, you know, Reality window. Yeah. So, yeah, we're discussing history. <laughs> this is yeah, this is archaic almost. <laughs> I have had uh, I had I've had a few Bantu warriors who were unsuccessful in attacking me who called the police on me before. I almost got shot by uh, a short blonde Caucasian police officer who had a I thought she had a gorgeous figure. She had a really nice ass and she was holding her gun screaming at me the whole time because uh, I had the terminity who to uh, deny my wallet to a man who only outweighed me by 100 pounds and was 20 years younger than me. He didn't feel like he could get the job done without his friends or without a gun. So he backed off of me, and then he called the cops on me. And this blonde bitch with a 9 millimeter Glock came after me, and I was saved by an African-American cop, a young man who uh, talked her out of uh, using force against me, uh, all for the crime of... Uh, refusing to bend over and grab my ankles for uh, what would be shock and zulu. All right. <laughs> okay. And, you know, that's where, that's where the pigs get you. I mean, I, it, you know, so it's uh, the cops, to me, I've always known what they are based on the outcome of having them around. The outcome of having them around is the fact that I've always got to be by myself because if I'm with another guy that looks like me, we're getting rolled up on by the pigs at least three deep. And the fact that if I ever go with a weapon, a weapon that's visible that would keep, if I could just put a saber or a bowie knife on my hip, there's not, there's not an African American dude in this country that would ever offer me violence. I guarantee you. I, I've, I spent my life living with these guys. I worked with more of them than I've worked with guys like you. They yeah. wouldn't mess with me. I'm just going to nod to them respectfully and go upon my way. I'm not going to give them any trouble. I dress like a bum. I wear 30-year-old clothes. Uh, they're going to leave me alone. The only person that's going to hassle me is going to be the pig. So I can't wear that Bowie knife. And it was in my room for 38 years in Baltimore. But I only slipped it behind my belt a couple of times when I had a premonition that, that you know, that they were finally going to come on me in force. And, uh, you know, so... I could be at peace. I could be walking down the street with uh, with a CSA cavalry saber on my hip and every brother in town would leave me alone. But no, the cops will not permit that. The rich white people that write the laws to keep my dirty ass uh, helpless against my traditional attackers, they won't permit that. Why do you think um, – and in some other talks you've mentioned that <clears throat> they chose uh, – the safest mid-sized city, Portland, and <clears throat> large cities, New York City and Seattle, to be the um, kind of testing ground for this That's new easy. wave. That's easy. Okay, so the only uh, – of the top 25 cities in the United States, of all the cities I know about, the only city in the United States that successfully waged the drug war and reduced violent crime. OK. With their own funding, without being dependent upon federal funding, even though they might have taken some, they were not dependent upon it. The NYPD, 36,000 strong, seventh largest military in the world. OK, that's the NYPD this time last year. Got the job done under 200 murders a year. OK, 
where you got a little shithole like Baltimore that's not a quarter the size of the smallest of the smallest of the five boroughs in New York has got 350 murders a year, or 330, or 340, 320, depending on the year. If you want to go to federal policing, and you want to go to corporation-based policing and private policing, you, you need to crash that model because that's a successful model right there. You need to crash that. Okay. So that's number one. They did that. They totally ripped the guts out of the NYPD in like two months, which was quite an operation. And I had a few long conversations with an active NYPD officer. Okay. It was on the front lines all year long. All right. Now, Portland uh, was the safest mid-sized city in the United States. And they did it with a very humane and civic friendly model of policing. They really did. It was the only cops, the only city cops, the only cops in American cities that I've ever been around and wasn't terrified was the Portland Police Department. I was really impressed with how they conducted themselves. So they attacked them. And Seattle is the safest, largest city. And they, so they attack those three police departments. These are the, these should be your three models for police behavior in the country. Yet yeah. those are the ones that are attacked. The Chicago PD is dirty as hell, as scared as I am of the uh, of the BPD. Christ, if, if you had the B Baltimore Police Department and the Chicago Police Department went to war, it would be a one day war. It would look like Israel rolling over Jordan in 1967. OK, <laughs> you know, the Chicago yeah. Police Department it should scare any sane human being. Right. I mean, that's, yeah, I won't I be mean, Chicago, that's, some scary, that's some scary dudes. I mean, they're like <laughs> Illinois boys, right? They hunt. <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, I mean, so, yeah, man, that was, uh, why didn't they go after the Chicago PD? Why didn't they go after the Detroit PD? Okay. They didn't because those, you know, those cities have already been shit canned. And those cities are already platforms for attacking the surrounding suburbs. You know, now that your army of internal exovasion has already, you know, won and is ready to start in, invading. There was uh, when I was in Illinois, I, I got into Chicago the day the Miracle Mile was looted and they had a heavy security around a train station. An entire U-Haul dealership, a bunch of uh, white people went in there and rented all the U-Haul trucks. They loaded them with Chicago hood rats. And they went out to this elite subdivision near Plainfield, Illinois, and the local cops used Jersey walls to barricade the mall. I bet you didn't hear this on the news. And no. I bet you have a hard time following it. But I was there. I was the next subdivision over. That was a decoy. They weren't going to the mall. They went to subdivisions and looted the subdivisions. Home invasions. None of it made the news. People reported it on social media. It got fact-checked and taken down. People had to leave their houses. And with these hood rats who were being managed by wealthy Caucasian Americans, they did this. This was a suburb of where again? I'm sorry. Between Plainfield and Chicago, Illinois. Okay. God. Um, good, luck, good luck finding that. So yeah. this is... The way the news is, you, you can actually have military level operations against a group of pale faces. It will not make anything. It, it will not make a ripple. So do you yeah. think that those people in those suburbs are moving out now? <laughs> yeah. I guess they can. Yeah, if they can, if they can. But you're also talking about people who husband and wife are both working their asses off to make a, a very large housing note. And now yeah. their housing values are going down. Yeah. And now they're maybe on reduced income because of the bullshit pandemic. Yeah. So, uh, it's, uh, the, the desire th th there aren't plans. There's just a desire. The elite people in this country have a desire to ghettoize and get rid of and exile the, uh, the people who were racially most like them. Okay but aren't like them uh, politically, ethically, metaphysically. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, 
I guess. Um, How many African dictators have used European mercenaries to murder their own people? You know, I mean, <laughs> every every race does this. Yeah. During the Taiping Rebellion, who did uh, the Chinese government use to slaughter 15 million Christian Chinese? British mercenaries and U.S. Confederate veterans in the ever victorious army. Okay, you know, so every we're race gonna have a we're every we're going to have a whole we're going to have a whole <laughs> uh, episode about you know the uh, nastiness of uh, Anglo history in Haiti. the uh, early in, modern period. <laughs> in Haiti, there's a there's a uh, a photo from the 1920s that shows these two mulatto, the president and the prime minister of Haiti, two mulatto guys in a country where they rule over coal black people. I mean, people that are like, look like they came right out of Africa, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Look nothing like African-Americans. The two presidents look like African-Americans. Okay. They're ruling over a country of people who look like Africans. Yeah. And on either side of them and behind them are U.S. Marines. Yeah. Like that. Okay. People you know, don't know about those wars in the Caribbean in the 1920s and such. Yeah. So it's like this is uh, it's not that Caucasians are not the only people that try to eradicate disagreeable portions, <laughs> yeah. or the majority portion of their own ethnicity. No. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is just the way peoples have been forever. And the mercenary element of modern day policing like you said having people that you know whether it be in baltimore in 2015 or in katrina in 2005 or what we're getting into now in 2021 um you know we're having i guess we're getting we're going to get ready here to have more and more people that are if a police department wasn't really connected to its community before there's going to be it seems like there's going to be a whole other level of disassociation between the people that police you and and you know your community at large like there's just going to be more of a disconnect between 2014 baltimore police department was 71 percent of them were residents of some other municipality in 2014 now and that's that's rather normal in New York, almost nobody on duty in Manhattan lives in Manhattan. Well, one, they can't afford it. Mm -hmm. They live in New Jersey or they live upstate. Okay, so this is even the model for a successful police department like the NYPD. And it's also the model for an unsuccessful police department like the Baltimore Police Department. So for some reason, other than effectiveness, it's preferred as a model. <laughs> yeah, it. I guess it kind of makes sense. I mean, because there might be some sympathy if if it was the other way. You know, they might you might be a little less inclined to pull the trigger or to shake someone down or whatever. Well, yeah, this is why. Look, if if the U.S. military is going to be used to like resettle Native Americans from, let's say, Utah to uh, you know to Arizona or something like that. They're going to use the first mountain division that's like based around the Great Lakes and, you know, the trains in upstate New York. And any Utah boys that are in that division are going to get transferred to the units that are currently operating in Afghanistan or uh, someplace else. OK, so there's not going to be any Utah boys in that division that's sent to move all the people out of Utah to make room for people from Burma or wherever they're coming from. OK, you know, I mean, this is so it, it goes with military operations, too. Yeah. And, and um, if you're the Romans, you take your Germans with you into Parthia and you take your Parthians with you into Germania. Yeah. I mean, come on, it's, it's not that complicated. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's really depressing, honestly, talking about this. <laughs> That's why oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was, having, I was starting to have fun. But, uh. <laughs> yeah, because you're partially more red pilling me, um, I admit. Um, but uh, that's okay. Uh, and it, it, I guess, um, 
I guess that the last holdouts, like you said, in the Rocky Mountains, <laughs> um, you'll start. This is interesting kind of um, prediction is I never heard anyone say this before about uh, gunsmiths, you know, uh, look, I, I guess the audience and everybody be on the lookout for it's going to be hard to find. But the first arrest being these people that, you know, have oh, yeah, been, and yeah. it'll be some kind of terrible person, you know, yeah. they'll. You know, They'll make a social media movie. post will be taken out of context. Uh, I mean, you'll look, get a pink-haired lesbian, a strange stepdaughter to say that you know he was a yeah. bad guy. I mean, but what, what, whatever you need. I wrote an uh, I wrote a short novel called Ghost Snatcher that'll be published sometime, probably in a couple of months, uh, which is about uh, the disarmament of the last ghost people in the Rocky Mountains. And it's written from the point of view of a company of five social justice heroes of uh, Ebony Hue. Okay. Uh, there's uh, Mainline Watson, Crankshaft Witherspoon, Acetylene Jackson, and Old School Johnson are amongst the four, uh, four heroes that are, go to disarm the last Yetis in the Rocky Mountains. So I felt really good about writing that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's called justice their armored car is called justice server 42 and the guy that i forget his name they called him sunshine he's a character that's based on me but as a as a like a mulatto or quadroon guy and he's just graduated from the portland social justice academy and he's given command of this unit and he's got like the four most decorated combatants from this crusade against the evil guilty ghosts and uh of course, these guys are like really, these guys are badasses, right? So they're like the four worst guys in the Dirty Dozen. And uh, they nickname him Sunshine because he's so light skinned. And after he gets out of the office with his orders, out of the command post, he comes outside and they've erased Justice Server 42 and they've spray painted Ghost Snatcher on the side of it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds so, yeah, and these guys are, like, all based on friends of mine. And I even had numerous friends who volunteered to be killed by them. <laughs> uh, so they're based on, like, black dudes that I've trained with. Yeah. And that I've worked with. And yeah. some of the, and they all tell a story about, like, their most, like, memorable bust. And I've actually had friends of mine who look like me who actually volunteered to be their victims, you know, like, uh, in famous, as they recount their stories of, you know, what it was like, you know, hunting down the last pale faces, you know, across the, across the nation and everything. And one of my friends volunteered to actually be the target of, the, of their, <laughs> of their like recovery <laughs> outfit. So it was a lot of fun. You know, I had a yeah. good time. Uh, Some nice irony in there. They're like the full <laughs> circle, the full circle of uh, the, the pale face being the hunter and then being the hunted. Yeah. Yeah. yeah which is, it, it's a great part of it. This is where a lot of these, you know, blue-eyed Indians come from. Exactly. Yeah, and um, we're definitely going to get into that in another episode too. Well, uh, I think it's been a good talk about the kind of predation element of the police and the development of the police. And um, is is there anything else that you would like to say in closing? Well, the militarization of the police under the Israeli model, which it actually was under the Israeli model, and there were uh, Israeli trainers that helped develop our police for the uh, drug war. That's already been accomplished. So you have a militarized police force, which is really not any good in a riot setting. Okay. Cause it's bad optics. What it's good for is rating against like individual households right, is the model. So you could see police being used more often in that role, uh, which the, it has been their prominent role. Anyhow, that's not going to change. Just who they're pointed at is going to be different. Uh, the civic police, you know, like the guys, uh, you know, the regular police officer that would come to your house because your cat got caught up your your tree or, you know, you had to complain about the, the teenagers next door being too loud with the rock and roll music. That kind of police officer is now in the future going to be tied in more and more with the medical establishment. Yes, uh, and the technology is going to help develop that further with right. Amazon owning and every, everything and probably getting I bet you Amazon gets involved in the medical okay. profession somehow. And now uh, 
policing the urban environment is already, I've seen the drones, fleets of drones in Baltimore. They have a military drone, a really big one over Baltimore City. And they also have fleets of small drones that fly, that fly like a murder of crows in a pack. All right. So, and I predicted it. I wrote, uh, I wrote a science fiction horror story called Skulker Jones uh, about four years ago. And it's set, uh, it's set in uh, Baltimore uh, like 20 years from now. Uh, in an age when you have like a Sharia mes- militia, you got a bacon, lettuce, and tomato militia. You got these different militias on the streets and, that are authorized to carry weapons. And individual citizens and unaffiliated criminals are, they are maintained at a disarmed status by drones. So I really theorize that you're eventually going to have drones that zip tie you, that actually come and get you. They come to the sound of a gunshot. They they trace you. And then these drones will zip tie you. And they'll just leave you for the rats to eat or for the hood rats to sodomize or you know, wh- whatever for the night for the Nigerian, uh, you know, refugees to turn into dog food and or barbecue or whatever they're going to do. You know, I think eventually, uh, you know, you're even going to have uh, government drones in in American municipalities that are going to play a hand in uh, feeding uh, Native Americans and you and I are Native Americans to, let's say, Nigerian cannibals. You know, which I think is like just totally cool. I, I unfortunately probably won't live to see that, but I'd love to live in a world like that. So I write novels set in this kind of place. Yeah, it's gonna make Blade Runner look. Dude, the real future is gonna make Blade Runner look like Romper Room. It's gonna make Blade Runner look like what again? Romper Room. Yeah, you probably don't remember what Romper Room was. So I started writing a novel this morning called Drinking with a Gay Giraffe. Okay, which is about the last man that has avoided vaccination he belongs to a fanatical cult of underground bodybuilders and health nuts and he's going to wage a one-man war against the met the corporate medical corporate medical police state okay Uh, we can definitely get into some of this theorizing and um and stuff like that when we talk about rollerball and other dystopian films which is another uh episode we got planned oh cool cool cool. yeah that's uh, that sounds great uh uh, I've got a few of those novels coming out this year, including American Dream Boat, which is uh, my theory of massive Nigerian uh, boat lifts on decommissioned Nimitz class carriers uh, to the eastern United States. <laughs> <laughs> and then that will see the advent of the machete virus. Now that's going to be a hell of a vaccine. They're going to—I think that's going to be the chain mail vaccine. <laughs> yeah, guys. <laughs> People better start um, you know, learning how to fight, you know, stick fighting and, and uh, sword fighting, I guess, uh, in the next couple of years. Um, it might be a good a good uh, way to go. Um, you know, yeah, look out for the machete virus has already showed up in Baltimore. There's a couple of machete fatalities a year now for the past few years. And uh, oh, who would have thought I never heard of that before? <laughs> yeah. And I was an early practitioner of the machete virus. I once hacked up a guy when I was 18 with a homemade sword that I made out of a fence post over a coal fire in the woods. Okay. That, that's how I ended up in Baltimore because the only other place I had family was in Baltimore when I had to uh, leave Washington, Pennsylvania uh, because of a pending lawsuit after I uh, avoided criminal prosecution for my heinous violent crime. So yeah. The, uh, well, we can I'm get real, in. Yeah. yeah we're going to get, get into uh, some of that too. When I'm sure when we talk about, um, ancient Greek boxing and wrestling and combat sports, which, you know, uh, the audience, uh, I hope you guys look forward to that because I think that's the next topic on the docket, so to speak. Well, that's all uh, that that's basically all uplifting stuff there. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of uh, receding back into the ancient times, at least in my own mind. Um, yeah. And yeah. Uh, I'm uh, yeah, I. Uh, I, I, I look forward to doing that. I uh, hope I didn't uh, send anybody looking for a bowl of Prozac. Uh, <laughs> no, probably just me. I'm the I'm the uh, sentimental, probably the most sentimental uh, type of the audience. <laughs> well, the, you know, look, if the 
look at it this way. The shittier the world gets, mm -hmm. okay, if you're operating under a heads up situation and mm -hmm. you know it and you're not believing, you're not believing all the lies, mm -hmm. then it, it, it really, it could make life into a playground. <laughs> it could. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it could. Um, and at least if it's nothing else, you know, it's, I guess it's really. As long as you're not going to fix it. You know, if you yeah. go to Hawaii, you're not going there to keep the tide from coming in. You're not no. going there trying to figure out how you're going to build a big concrete pier that's going to prevent this wave from cresting. You're just going to go out there with your surfboard and surf them. Exactly. That's a good Americans, Americans think like the civic engineer whose purpose is to keep the tide from coming in, to make sure that there's no wave you know, uh, coming in to wipe out some little kitty sand cats, you know, so the only change you need to do is think more like the surfer than, uh, than the know, engineer. Yeah. Civic engineer. Yeah. Well, with that, um, I thank you, James. It's been great. And I look forward to next time. Everybody Thanks, else. Rusty. You're welcome. Uh, this is Rusty. And with James, it's Rusty Vinets. Good night.